Good morning, or afternoon, wherever we're at. As soon as they can get organized, uh, and I'm no, no pressure on this, it's not a, a big issue one way or the other, but um, we have some deacons who are uh, getting some materials together. I have two little pocketbooks. I'd like each family uh, to have one of each. Um, and uh, they'll be passing them out, so that's what that's all about. Um, <clears throat> Let me get my uh, computer set up here. Okay, if we could switch over to the input from my machine. Auto in progress, we're working on it. Technology is great when it technologizes. There we go. Okay. Can we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Father, we invite your presence once again. We thank you for this weekend, for this privilege. We pray that you would be with us as we cover material now rapidly. May it find a place in our hearts and minds, and may it be a blessing to us and through us to others, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, everything that I do comes from a Seventh-day Adventist history kind of uh, perspective. That's just where I happen to work mostly. And I've found it the most fruitful uh, avenue for resolving questions that I have in my own mind, and so I, I like that. Um, since the um, theme of the camp meeting is light, um, the sermon here, this, the title is The True Light. Notice the um, subheading there, just short of destruction. That will make sense once we get on a little bit further in. This is going, I'm going to have to go quickly. My apologies. If, um, if, if you can't understand what I'm saying, wave your hand, but I will talk quickly because we're giving a condensed version of something it would normally take about two hours. So, <clears throat> one of the uh, more admired traits in the business world these days is thinking outside the box. That's uh, apparently a great idea. Everybody, you know, oh, he's really thinking outside the box, or you need to think outside the box, or whatever. And, and somehow, apparently, we've all been stuck in boxes, and we need to start thinking outside of them. And that seems to be a big thing with the, the business world. Innovation can be good. It can also be disastrous. One of the first big inno innovators, perhaps the biggest innovator of all time, was an individual by the name of Lucifer, who decided to think outside the box and come up with some new ideas of his own. Basically, Lucifer was telling the angels, let's try something new. Instead of this whole thing of everybody worrying about everybody else, why don't we all just take care of ourselves? You know? Why should I be worrying about all of you guys? It's, it's, it's an awful lot of different people to try and keep track of. I'll just take care of myself, you take care of yourself, everything will be happy, it's, it's, all, it's a good deal. Let's just do that. Well, <clears throat> uh, that led to what uh, the Bible refers to as the mystery of iniquity. And you're familiar with this verse. I'm going to just, uh, those who perish because they didn't receive the love of the truth, right? Notice down there, uh, they should believe the lie. The lie. It's not just a lie. It is the lie. Uh, there's a very specific lie. What is that lie that those who do not receive the love of the truth end up believing? Well, in order to uh, understand that lie, we're going to go back to Isaiah 14. Again, another... Um, familiar uh, passage. We use this all the time in the evangelistic series, talking about Lucifer. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now, we could look at that and we could say, you know, Lucifer is not going to end up that way. It's just not going to, it ain't going to happen, man. Uh, but is he lying? Is he boasting? What, what is this all about? Um, I would say that the key thing, the lie, is actually hidden down at the end of the verse. And we read over it and we don't recognize it for what it is. What Lucifer's saying is, I'm going to do all this stuff. I'm going to ascend. I'm going to exalt myself, basically, right? I will exalt my throne. I will sit in the, in the highest place at the feast, rather than going to the lowest place in the feast, right? Um, 
I will ascend above the clouds, and when I do all that, I will be like the Most High, because that's what God does. That's the lie. The lie, simply put, is that God is selfish. Okay? That's the lie right there. <clears throat> I don't want to play devil's advocate for very long here, but for just a moment, it's not hard to see how he could possibly kind of, uh, you know, make a presentation in that direction. I mean, after all, why is it that everybody in heaven worships God? Did that just happen, or did maybe God set it up that way? Lucifer was the choir director. Why do all the hymns of heaven praise God? We just don't have any lyricists that can think of anything else? Or, or did maybe God exalt himself and set it up that way? Well, <clears throat> yeah, so Lucifer said, I'm going to be like God, and you guys ought to too. I'm going to just simply take care of myself. We call that selfishness today. But bear in mind, this was at a time when no one had seen these ideas, no one had heard these ideas, no one had ever heard a lie. No one knew what in the world this guy was doing outside of his little box. Okay? Well, let's see. <clears throat> um, one thing is important to remember. We will never be able to explain the origin of sin. That's what this says. I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm not going to bother to read it all. We will never be able to explain the origin of sin. Perfect universe, perfect creation, perfect God, perfect angels, perfect Lucifer, and somehow sin cropped up in the middle of all that. We cannot explain it. If we could explain it, it would be to provide an excuse for it. And if there was an excuse for it, it wouldn't be sin. It would be a, a, reasoned, a reasoned thing, okay? So we're told over and over, Ellen White says, that we can never explain the origin of sin. Well, that's true. But... Uh, we can and should understand a lot of other things about Lucifer's rebellion. We can never uh, explain why he chose to sin. But once he chose, we can, with a little careful study and thinking, we can understand why he chose to sin the way he did. Does that make sense? Okay? It's a little bit like, suppose country A attacks country B. We may never fully understand why they bothered to attack, but when we look at the situation, oh, they came from the West and they did this, that, and the other thing, we could say, oh, there's a reason they did it the way they did it. Once they decided to attack, does that make sense? You see the distinction I'm making? Nod heads vigorously? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Come on, people. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Uh, <clears throat> notice this. Satan hates mankind because they are the workmanship of God. He opposed the creation of man. This was in heaven. Lucifer said, that's not a good idea. Don't do that. Why did he say that? What did Lucifer have against us? We weren't even created yet, so we obviously hadn't done anything, you know, we hadn't done anything to him. <laughs> what was the big problem in his mind? Well, we get a clue about this by looking at Lucifer's job description. He who was once the covering cherub, whose work it was to hide from the heavenly intelligences the glory of God, perverted his intellect and divorced himself from God. Notice his job. It was his job to hide from the heavenly intelligences the glory of God. Now, Lucifer was not allowed in on the innermost level of planning for the creation of mankind and of earth, but he evidently knew enough about it to know something was underfoot. You can't oppose something that you don't know anything about. And maybe he understood this before it happened. Adam and Eve were granted communion with their maker with no obscuring veil between. Just think about that for a minute. Look at his job description. Look at what they were granted. Is that a reason for Lucifer to be, become selfish? No, it's not. No, it's no reason whatsoever. It's not an excuse for sin, but is an explanation of why, after he had chosen to become self-centered and selfish, that he would be very upset with mankind. Does that make sense? 
You with me? Okay. Now, I say it's not an excuse for sin. No, it's not an excuse for sin. What he should have said, if he, if he had not already chosen selfishness, when God comes along and says, Lucifer, uh, I'm going to create these folks down here on earth, and they won't need your services. And I don't have all the slides in the longer presentation, but the rest is, is a, you know, a whole string of other slides that basically demonstrate from Ellen White that eventually human beings are intended to rise higher than the angels. And so if God comes to Lucifer and says, they won't be needing you down there, and in time, though they are created lower than the angels, they will advance, you will stay put, and they will end up above you. Lucifer's response should have been, praise the Lord, what a wonderful new opportunity to find out how command structure works. I, I've been stuck at the top all this time. For the first time in my life, I'll, get, I'll have the privilege of taking orders from someone other than God directly. What a, what a wonderful new experience that will be for me. And to an unselfish person, that would have been the, the, the rational response. Lucifer had by this time already chosen selfishness. Okay, <clears throat> let's go on. So maybe that's why we have this little interesting account. The creation of our world was brought into the councils of heaven. There the covering cherub, that would be Lucifer, prepared his request that he should be made prince to govern the world then in prospect, we would say then in planning. This was not accorded him. Jesus Christ was to rule the earthly kingdom. Under God, he engaged to take the world with all its probabilities. And interestingly enough there, probabilities, I believe that includes the probability that Adam might sin. Jesus knew what he was getting into when he took this job. It's a good thing that Jesus was granted the governorship of our planet and race. If we had sinned under Lucifer's leading, there would have been no one in the right position to redeem us. You know, it goes on, the law of heaven should be the standard law for this new world, for human intelligences. Lucifer was jealous of Christ, and this jealousy worked into rebellion, and he carried with him a large number of the holy angels. Okay, so again, this is no excuse for sin, and he didn't, eh, lost a little cover here, he did not get what he wanted this time, um, and that, of course, this, the last sentence there, he led these angels into rebellion, and that's why we now find ourselves in the middle of a war, and it's incredibly important that we, at some point or the other, get our heads on straight and realize that the enemy wants to kill us as in dead. You know, it's, 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 just, it's, it's stunning, actually, and I'm not saying that I'm any better than the next guy. If somebody walked in the back door with machine gun and started spraying the crowd, we'd be worried. We've got an enemy who's trying to do worse than that, and we spend most of our time snoozing. It's just, it's just not an appropriate response. Okay. God wants us to sharpen up a little bit. God calls for far more tact more wise generalship than he has yet been given by his human agents. There is need of sharp, sanctified thinking and keen work to counteract the ingenious plans of Satan. We are in a war. And stupid soldiers usually die. <laughs> Hate to say it, but that's just that's the truth. The least you gotta know is how to follow orders. <laughs> And we need some folks who can follow orders at the highest level. <laughs> That's where the generalship part comes in, okay? If we're going to do this sharp, sanctified thinking God wants us to do, we're going to have to pay attention to some details that we usually just skim over like zip quick. At the final condemnation of Satan, when the hosts of rebellion from the first great rebel to the last transgressor are asked why they have broken the law of God, they will be speechless. There will be no answer to give, no reason to assign that will carry the least weight. Well, that's great. That's because there is no reason for sin. But along the way, come on, you know and I know that Lucifer's come up with hundreds of reasons for sin. He hit me first, right? You <laughs> know, whatever. There's all sorts of reasons for sin. It's just at the end of the day, none of them will carry any weight. Why will they not carry any weight? Because the wise generalship of Christ and a little contribution now and then, perhaps, from some of us down here, 
simply cooperating and following directions, by the way, that wise generalship is going to counteract the intrigues and the influences of Satan. That's when the victory is finally won. Well, let's see. Let's take a look at the, uh, the devil's side of the argument here. Can I just... Uh, I'm going to move this up here. I think it will work out better for me. Almost. There we go. That's what I want. Well. Okay, my apologies. That was maybe a bad idea, but I think we can make it work. Uh, where'd it go? Where'd it go? There we go. Thank you, thank you. Okay, it'll come up in a moment. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to give you the reasons behind all these things right now. That's uh, like several chapters in a book. But uh, when Lucifer started the rebellion in heaven, there were certain accusations that he presented. We might think there were millions of accusations. No, there weren't. Actually, it's, it's, it's fairly simple. There were only nine, okay? He said, angels are holy by nature and wise enough to govern themselves, so they don't need God's law. God was unfair when he exalted Jesus above Lucifer. He said God is proud, God is selfish. He said God's law is defective and it needs to be changed. He said because it's defective, neither angels nor human beings, who hadn't even been created yet, remember, can obey God's law. This is the key one. Uh, this is, yeah, this is huge actually. Uh, if you're really looking for something interesting to wrap your brain into, take on this question of what it means when Lucifer said God's law is arbitrary, God said, no, it's not. Lucifer said, yes, it is. And he said, because of the way God treats his law, it makes it impossible for forgiveness. If anybody ever sinned, they could never be forgiven. And last but not least, Lucifer said, God is lying about all of the above because everything that Lucifer said, God said, no, that's not right. Now, imagine that I am politician A, and now I'm politician B, and we have a little uh, town hall meeting type of thing because we're both running for mayor of Los Angeles, say, no offense to whoever's currently mayor. Um, politician A, you know, steps up and he says, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad you came out to listen today. It speaks well of your, your citizenship and all that sort of stuff. There's an important point that you need to understand before we even begin this debate, and that is that my opponent, politician B, is a notorious liar. You cannot believe anything that he says. And then politician A goes ahead and he speaks for about five minutes, because that's all the time he gets in his first time to talk. Politician B gets up. What's the first thing he's going to want to say? I'm not a liar. And politician A says, he just lied. In debate, in formal logic and formal debate studies, that's known as the fallacy of poisoning the well. Politician A has poisoned the well of politician B. So you don't know whether you can believe anything this guy says. Okay? What the effect of that is, is that the moment one opponent accuses the other of blatant dishonesty, proclamation becomes worthless. Listen to that. I can never say I am honest because you have already had the doubt planted in your mind. You don't know whether I can believe my statement when I say that I'm honest. Once you've been accused of, of dishonesty, you have no other recourse than to demonstrate. That's a deep thought. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, yeah, that was a good reaction. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> now, put yourself in God's position. So somebody comes up and he says all this about, about you. What are you going to do about it? Well, you know, God's actually very smart. And so we might think, wow, boy, I bet he's got all sorts of ways to handle this problem. You know, swat him this way, swat him that way. Bam, bam. He's got, I mean, he's got a thousand ways of which we know nothing to solve our problems. How many must he have for his own way, right? Or his own problem? You know, what's really interesting is that Ellen White doesn't talk about all the ways that God had. She talks about all the things that he couldn't do. Now, we kind of react negatively to that because we have this, this true in its own context, but this nice childish faith that, well, God can do anything. No, no, there's actually a whole bunch of things God can't do. 
God desired that a change take place and that the work of Satan be brought out in its genuine aspect, but the exalted angel standing next to Christ was opposed to the Son of God. The underworking was so subtle that it could not be made to appear before the heavenly host as the thing it really was. God couldn't do that. Satan could not be represented or could not be presented to the universe at once in his real character. His crooked course must be allowed to continue until he should reveal himself as an accuser, a deceiver, a liar, and a murderer. Okay? Uh, we're not going to read this one, but it says the same things. But notice the two words. Some things were impossible and other things must be done. Okay? We think, oh, God can do anything. But impossible means he can't do it and must means he has to. What if he doesn't feel like it? No, he has to. Okay? This is war, and sometimes it gets really awkward and inconvenient. Okay? Well, here's another statement. Notice this one. Um, again, I'm not, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it, but just little bits and pieces. Time must be given, right? Let's just go here. Uh, time must be given to develop the principles. The universe must see worked out. God's order must be contrasted. Satan's rule must be revealed. God's law must be demonstrated. It's unchangeable, perfect, and eternal. That's a lot of things that must be done. And Ellen White tells us there was only one way, only one possible way that that could be. And that was the way that God chose, wisely enough. The rest of the universe understood this far better than we do. The unfallen world saw that the character of God could be vindicated only through this trial and conflict of the two forces. The attributes of God must be made to appear of the stability of his government, there must be no question. Lucifer had raised all sorts of questions. God has to get rid of them. So this is something that we often see in politics. You know, the great controversy is, is, is just the first political contest. It's all the same thing. It's, um, you can guess which side most of the politicians come down on today. But anyhow, um, you've got two, two politicians. They're running for the same, um, op, you know, same position or something like this, same office. And they're saying all sorts of terrible things about each other. And surely you must have at one point or the other sat back and said to yourself, yeah, what if they're both telling the truth? <laughs> what if both politicians are actually miserable, rotten rats? I know that's a stretch of your imagination, perhaps. But, but what if, what if they're telling the truth about each other? Now, God had to do more than just let Satan discredit himself. That was part of it. Satan's principles must be demonstrated. That would discredit Satan. But God had to respond himself to vindicate his own character. Does that make sense? You see the, the two-step process there? Okay. How is he going to do that? <laughs> well, the simple answer is he had to convince everyone in the entire universe that his government was the only government they wanted. Yeah, how many, how many, how many, for want of a better word, how many people are there in the entire universe? I don't know. Let's just say gazillions, okay? How are you going to convince gazillions of folks out there that this is the government? I mean, just, just imagine, you know? Uh, imagine somebody out there in the universe who says, yeah, wow, well, look at that, man, that, Satan's ideas, that was really messed up. But, you know, God's got some funny things, too. I think this is the way it ought to be. Right? Or this. Or this. Or this. Just imagine you've got a street. It goes through a residential district, but it's kind of a major street. Let's just say that, you know, something like uh, 40,000 people go through that street every day trying to get to work on time. And they're getting tired of this low speed limit. You've got a 35-mile-an-hour speed limit, right? And these guys are just chomping at the bit because they're trying to get to work on time. Look how much money you're costing the economy by having that 35-mile speed limit. So you have a big town hall about it, and everybody gets there, and there's a whole bunch of people saying, yeah, it needs to be 50, you know, and this is ridiculous. And then some young mother stands up, and she says, but hold on just a minute. I live on that street. I've got three kids under the age of four. And I do my best to watch them, but you know what? Sometimes the ball goes in the street. You're talking about the life of my child. It shouldn't even be 35. It should be a 25-mile-an-hour speed limit. Oh, brother. Now we've got some people say 25. We've got some people say 50. What's the right answer? And how are you ever going to, dis to decide? This is the problem that God was up against. How do you get the entire universe to agree? Well, 
He who sins is of the devil, it says in 1 John, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The key word here is manifested, means made obvious. Let's go on, we're going to run out of time here, this is terrible. No verbal description could reveal God to the world. There you go. Proclamation will not do it. No verbal description could reveal God to the world. Through a life of purity, a life of perfect trust and submission to the will of God, a life of humiliation, such as even the highest seraph in the heaven, in heaven would have shrunk from, God himself must be revealed to humanity. And so God convinced the universe that his government was best by simply going further, offering more, being willing to put up with more, and sacrifice more for the, the good of those gazillions of people. And he would, could turn around and say, does anybody else want to do this? And the highest seraph in heaven would say, I don't want to. I do not want to do that. And Jesus said, then I'll do it. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness, it sustained him. Again, this is all a matter of revealing, of showing, of clarifying. It's a matter of actually changing our perception of God. It's rewiring our brains. Now we call that neuroplasticity. It's one of the hottest things in brain science, right? What makes all this much more complicated, though, is that, this, is that God intended to do more than just get rid of Satan's lies. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That's a whole other category. After the cross, after the, having demonstrated the character of God, the universe would have been perfectly happy if God had simply said, why don't we just fry the world? <laughs> Ellen White says they would be just as happy if he had destroyed the earth at that point. They would rise up in mass and say, Thou hast acted in righteousness, O God, for you have destroyed rebellion. And Jesus said, Actually, I want to save some of them. I want to go the extra mile. That's why we call this process something other than the plan of destruction, right? It's not even the plan of vindication. It's the plan of salvation, right? Now, one good thing is that what was needed to refute Satan's lies had a lot of overlap with what was needed to save sinners. So it was kind of a two-for-one deal. Without the correct knowledge of God, Right? Revelation of his character. Without the correct knowledge of God, the human family would be divested of all divine strength. That would, means they would have none. With false attributes kept before the mind as belonging to God, the human family would be the dupes of satanic lies and the subjects of satanic agencies, and he could practice upon their credulity with success. Some great vocabulary words in there, right? Dupes means somebody who's getting fooled, right? Credulity, we might say naivete, okay? Basically, it says, with the false attributes, if we don't see God as he is, we are toast. That's my... Paraphrase, okay? <clears throat> so how much misconception does it take to be a problem? <laughs> is this a matter of, well, you know, we kind of ought to generally get the right idea about God, or is this a matter of getting every point right? <laughs> so how important was this to Jesus? Christ loves the human race and has expressed this love in every action of his life. Every act of Christ's ministry was far-reaching in its purpose. It comprehended more than appeared in the act itself. A wise purpose underlay every act of Christ's life on earth. Everything he did was important in itself and in its teaching. Were the mind of man capable of understanding his dealings, every act of his earthly life would stand forth important, complete, and in harmony with his divine mission. Jesus came to earth... To teach man how to live a life of self-denial and self-sacrifice and how to carry out practical religion in their daily lives. He labored constantly for one object, just one, right? All his powers were employed for the one object, the salvation of man, and every act of his life tended to that end, right? Now, this is important. This, this last statement here is really important. Notice, he's teaching self-denial and self-sacrifice. That's a part of the one object which is the salvation of man. But how did he actually go about it? What, was, what were his actual methods? Well, let's go on. John 17, uh, now uh, Brother Kinder, I think it was this morning, 
stole all this here. So this is great. He says, I manifested your name, declared your name. Okay, this is the manifestation of the character of God. I'm going to just skip along. <clears throat> the great object that brought Christ to the earth was to reveal the Father. God is love. That, this was the great truth that Christ came to the world to reveal. The object of Christ's mission to the world was to reveal the Father. In all his ministry, all his self-denial and self-sacrifice. Why was he teaching us that? Because that's what he did, right? Okay. In all his ministry, all his self-denial and self-sacrifice, Christ's object was to reveal God to the world. Those lessons tied up with the salvation of men, right? It was the same means, self-sacrifice, self-denial, same means that Christ used to reveal the Father. Because the Father himself is self-denial and self-sacrifice. We call it love, right? God is love. Ellen White makes it even stronger and clearer. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth. M dash. The whole purpose was to set men right through the revelation of God. This is amazing stuff. And maybe it sounds a little bit strange because we seldom think of salvation in this way, right? Here we are. We see that the whole purpose of Christ's mission to earth was to set men right. And it was all to be accomplished by helping us see what God is like. But the statement continues. When the object of his mission was attained, M dash, again, that's a setting off in an ap apostrophic. Uh, construction, if you're into your grammar, right? The revelation of God to the world. This is the object of his mission, the revelation of God to the world. When that was attained, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and the character of the Father was made manifest to men. When, what did he say and when did he say that, oh yeah, we're done now? It is finished. <laughs> at the cross, at the end of the cross, it took the cross to demonstrate the character of God. We usually think Jesus came just to save us. Well, that's a little egocentric, perhaps. He did come to save us, and more besides, but the only way for him to do all that was to reveal the character of God. And when he did it, he pushed it to the absolute limit. God sent his Son into the world to reveal so far as could be endured by human sight the nature and the attributes of the, invisible, of the invisible God. There were times I think he let it la you know, kind of cross over just a little bit, like when he walked into the temple, he picked up a, a, a little whip thingy, you know. He never hit anybody, but everybody goes, whoa, 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 right? And just his countenance, and, his, and they go zinging out of there, right? Okay. His, Ellen White says he, he, his divinity flashed through humanity. It was a little more than they could endure, right? But normally he kept it down at an endurable level, right? Christ revealed all of God that sinful human beings could bear without being destroyed. Christ is the perfect representation of the Father. His life of sinlessness lived on this earth in human nature is a complete refutation of Satan's charge against the character of God. Now notice this. This is not some random effort. This is a direct response to and refutation of Satan's accusations against God's character. He wasn't just you know, he wasn't here on a vacation. He had a, a very specific, I, I'm going to do my best, but I, I'm afraid I will not be done in one minute. <laughs> okay. I hope you see how precise, how meticulous, how intentional every act of Christ's life was. He was here for a purpose because he was in a war and he knew what he had to do. Okay? He had to reveal the Father. And White calls it a perfect representation. How perfect is perfect? Notice this, had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling his glory and humbling himself that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed. <laughs> if, if the week before the incarnation, Jesus and God the Father were talking and said, hey, let's switch it up, why don't you go, I'll stay, we wouldn't have known the difference. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God in sight, in hearing, in effect. It is the voice and movements of the Father, which is exactly what Jesus said, right? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? I already did that, right? In order for us to cooperate with God, it's imperative that we understand all we can of Jesus' method, his strategy, his tactics in making this all-important revelation. Just exactly how did he reveal the Father? Jesus could not express in words the understanding of man, the love of the Father. Some things God can't do. 
Jesus could not express in words the understanding of man, the love of the Father. He could only say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's a problem here. Words don't do it. Even good words. The, 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 the most loved verse in the Bible. Wonderful words of life. They won't do it. But the statement goes on. He did express the love of God in his actions. Actions trump words every time. <clears throat> what strikes me as odd is how little we focus on these matters and how fragmented our ideas of Christ's work have become. We emphasize the sacrifice of the cross, but we too often fail to recognize its role in what Ellen White calls the whole purpose of revealing the Father, right? And when we do consider his work of revealing the Father, we seldom see that as the means, the active agent in the salvation of sinners. And yet, the Savior of the world devoted more time and labor to healing the afflicted and of their maladies than to preaching. I wonder why he spent more time doing that than preaching. It's because the one worked and the other didn't, okay? I'm very close to done. Christ came to this world for no other purpose. We already read that. I'm just going to go on. Christ revealed God to his disciples in a way that performed in their hearts a special work such as he has long been urging us to allow him to do in our hearts. Okay, so here we are. We're back at the accusations. Let's see how we're doing. Satan, I just have to go quickly through this. Satan demonstrated that the first two were false because he did stupid things, and he demonstrated that he did not have a holy nature, and he demonstrated that there was ample reason to choose Jesus above Lucifer, right? So the first two are gone. What about three and four? God is proud. God is selfish. Uh, you can't say that after, the, after Jesus' life, okay? So they're gone, okay? What about five and six? Well, you know, some things you can demonstrate. If, if somebody says you can't do that and then you do it, you just proved him wrong, right? right? So if I say I can bench press 400 pounds and you say I don't think so, but I do it anyhow, well, then I'm right, you're wrong. Sorry, that's just the way it goes, okay? So God's law is defective. It needs to be changed. It can't be kept. Jesus kept it. So that's progress. Two-thirds of the accusations have been wiped out. One-third still remain to this day. This is what we need to be working on. One third remain to this day. Why didn't Jesus take care of them? I mean, he was here. <laughs> did he forget? No, he did not forget. The problem with these last three is that they are intricately involved in the salvation of human beings. And it requires a new revelation, an additional revelation. It requires a revelation that involves human beings. And it requires wise generalship, sharp thinking, and the final victory of God's church. So how do you suppose we are supposed to do that? Three last statements, and we're done. Christ ministers must stand in an altogether different position. Now, this is, yeah, don't pick on the ministers. She's talking to them here, but this is you too, okay? Just you know, give the ministers a break. Christ ministers must stand in an altogether different position. They must be evangelists. They must be medical missionaries. They must take hold of the work intelligently. But it is of no use for them to think that they can do this while they drop the work which God has said should be connected with the gospel. If they drop out the medical missionary work, they need not think that they can carry forward their work successfully, for they have only half the necessary facilities. We have largely, for the last 110 years, been trying to do God's work with only half the necessary facilities. Let's go on. Let us remember that it is not by word and precept alone that we are to reveal Christ's character. Our works must bear witness to his indwelling presence in the heart. His disposition, his kindness, his compassion manifested in our actions will inspire hope in the minds and hearts of the most hopeless. Thus, in act as well as in word, we shall reveal to the word, world the character of the unseen. God's purpose in committing to men and women the mission that he committed to Christ is to disentangle his followers from all worldly policy and to give them a work identical with the work that Christ did. The little booklet you got, one of them was called Identical, This Is Why. This is the work that you have been given. It is identical to the work that Christ did. And the good news, Christ gave a perfect representation of true godliness by combining the work of a physician and a minister ministering to the needs of both body and soul, healing physical disease, and then speaking words that brought peace to the troubled heart. The good news, Christ has empowered his church to do the same work that he did during his ministry. Let's bow our heads for prayer. 
Father, we pray that you would take us, rewire our brains, give us a correct view of your nature, your character, and give us wisdom and sharp generalship that we can manifest that same character and further your, your battle in this great controversy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.